Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. It's an enormous pleasure to be joined by Timothy Garton Ash, historian, author, and professor of European Studies at Oxford University. Uh, Timothy's going to talk to us about his recent book, Homelands, which is available in all good bookshops and also at the back of the room here for anyone who's attending in person. To get a couple of items of housekeeping out of the way, then to quickly introduce Tim, Timothy, and then to um, hand over to him. Professor Garnash will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to Q&A with our audience. That's both of you who are here present in 8 North or Georgia Street in Dublin 1, and also those who are joining online, and uh, welcome to everybody. As ever, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom or by putting your hand up. Um, and you should see the Zoom uh, Q&A function on your screen. And please feel free to put in questions throughout the discussion. We'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. A quick reminder for all of us, including Timothy, that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And if you wish to participate in the discussion on Twitter, you can use the handle at IIEA. So I've known Timothy Garnash a little bit for a couple of years, but I've known him intellectually for much longer. And his a, a battered copy of the Magic Lantern traveled with me through various stages of my undergraduate and postgraduate career. Um, and so it's really lovely for me uh, to be presenting Timothy today to present it's a magnum opus, a wonderful book, uh, Homelands, which goes from post-war right up to post-post-Cold War. And it's really, Timothy will obviously present it more, more adequately and appropriately, but it just feels like a love letter of 50 years of a relationship with a continent, which I share, not quite 50 years yet, Timothy, but I share the passion for the place. It's as much a primer on Europe. So anybody who wants to know about this continent since the Second World War, it's a great place to start, but it's also just a gorgeous memoir. And you feel like you spend time with the author from watching the moon landings as a, as a schoolboy on, on an exchange in France to being around in 1989 and seeing and smelling and touching the revolution and then experiencing the UK's withdrawal and right up to Russia's atrocious war. Uh, it's just, it's both a very, very informative, wonderful, but also very intimate book, which I, I very much enjoyed reading. So I'm looking forward to Timothy telling us about it. But before handing over Timothy, just formally, I should give a bit more of a bio for our audience. Professor Garton Ash, he's a professor at, of, um, of European Studies at the University of Oxford, where I spent a, a glorious time in the, in the same place at the European Study Centre for, for a year. Timothy's also Isaiah Berlin Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, as mentioned, and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Timothy is the author of fully 11 books of political writing, most recently Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, as mentioned, the subject for today's discussion. But many of you will also know uh, Timothy also writes a column on international affairs and the Guardian, which over the past couple of years often felt like a, an, an oasis of sense and reason and what's often a, a desert in various parts of the British media. And Timothy is a, a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, amongst other journals. In terms of awards he has received for his writing include the Somerset Maughan Award, the Prix Européen de l'Essai, and the George Orwell Prize. Timothy, it's a great pleasure, and I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry. It's wonderful to be back here in uh, this wonderful institute in Dublin, in Ireland, and in the European Union. Uh, how lucky you are still to be in the European Union. I have to say, if I look at the progress Ireland has made over the 40 years since I first came to Dublin, and the regress my own country has made over the last 10 years, um, I could feel a bit depressed. I hope you won't mind my saying I would probably be Irish by now if my um, Irish grandmother had not very inconsiderately uh, chosen to be born in 1886 in Bozeman, Montana, rather than in Ireland. Um, didn't she know that 140 years later I would need her to have been born in Ireland? Um, and But nonetheless, I feel very much at home here. And that brings me to the very first point, which is that, um, that um, this book is, is very much about the Europe of lived experience. And one of the key features of that Europe of lived experience is that as Europeans, we can be at home abroad. 
So I'm abroad here, but I feel at home. The same is true in Budapest or in Warsaw or in Berlin. Um, that's pretty much unique to Europeans. Um, Chinese only have the one homeland. Uh, Americans, poor things, only have the one homeland, as in homeland security. Um, but as Europeans, we can have multiple homelands, hence the title of the book in the plural. This book took me just 50 years to write, uh, 50 years of traveling around Europe, worrying about Europe, studying Europe, writing about Europe. Um, and it's an unusual genre. It's history illustrated by memoir and reportage. So there's a whole series of stories and vignettes, all of them drawn from little notebooks like this, in which my visit to Dublin will also be recorded, um, in which I've recorded things since I started traveling to continental Europe in the early 1970s. But each of those stories uh, has a point. It illustrates a larger history. So for example, if I tell the story of um, walking down the street in East Berlin, just after the Berlin Wall came down and meeting an East Berliner who told me he'd just seen an improvised poster in a window which said, handwritten, only today is the war really over. That's not just an anecdote. I think it's expressed a profound truth about the whole of Europe behind the Iron Curtain. Or again, um, meeting Helmut Kohl. How many people in this room have seen Helmut Kohl? Hands up who's seen Helmut Kohl. Now, that's quite a high proportion. Well, you, I'm sure you will agree. Um, he was certainly the largest man I've ever met, both in height and in girth. He was what Dr. Dr. Johnson called a mountainous man. And uh, there is Helmut Kohl towering over me in his office in autumn 1991, talking about German and European unification. And suddenly he says to me, by the way, do you realize you're sitting opposite the direct successor to Adolf Hitler? There's a conversation stopper, if ever I heard one. Um, what I should have said is actually, Herr Bundeskanzler, there was Grand Admiral Dönitz in between Hitler and you, but I was too flabbergasted to, <laughs> to say anything. But of course, as you will all see, he was making a point. He had a real sense of history. Hitler had got everything wrong. Hitler had tried to put a German roof over Europe. He was going to try and put a European roof over Germany. Um, if I tell the story of meeting President George W. Bush in May 2001, summoned to brief him before his first official visit to Europe and first meeting with Putin. And at one point in this conversation, he said to this small group of advisors or invited guests, do we want the European Union to succeed? That's not just an anecdote about Bush and his ignorance. It's a story about the transatlantic relationship no earlier American president would have thought to ask that question. But presidents since George W. Bush have all asked that question. Do we want the EU to succeed? All the way through to um, chronologically, the last session, section of the book, which is about a trip to Ukraine in December 2022, where I met one of these incredibly brave Ukrainian soldiers, a man called Yevgen Hulevich. Um, an editor, a critic, a translator, who volunteered after the full-scale invasion on the 24th of February 2022, twice wounded, twice went back to the front, um, week by week by week, um, living in a foxhole he dug out himself with a spade he carried on his back, incredibly fierce fighting, seeing his friends die around him. I met him in early December last year, he said, I'm determined to go back because we have a lot of raw recruits and they really need experienced soldiers like me. He was killed by a Russian sniper near Bakhmut on the last day of last year. That's chronologically one of the last moments in the book. And that brings me to the larger story. So 
the, the history that this book is telling, painting with a very broad brush, is one of a ascending curve across roughly 35 years from the early 1970s to roughly around 2007 or 8. When I started traveling to continental Europe in 72, 73, it was still a Europe of dictators, right? More Europeans were living under dictatorships than under democracies, including, of course, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. We did the numbers, 389 million Europeans living under dictatorships, only 289 million living under democracies. And then starting with Spain, Portugal, and Greece, you have this 35 year story, again, painting with a very broad brush of the spread of freedom and the enlargement of the geopolitical West. The European community from six to 27, NATO from 15 in 1972, to 26 in 2007, eight. Of course, there were many major setbacks along the way. One has only to think of the wars of former Yugoslavia or 9-11. Although by the way, 9-11 with hindsight is not the great turning point in European history we thought at the time. I think it's 2008 rather than 9-11. Um, and then from 2008 onwards, the combination of the global financial crisis and the Putin seizure of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the beginning of what's sometimes called the poly crisis, or more accurately, I would say a chain of crises, because poly crisis somehow suggests simultaneity, whereas actually it's a chronological sequence of crises. Global financial crisis segues into a great recession, Eurozone crisis. Um, the demolition of democracy by Viktor Orban in Hungary begins already in 2010, it's worth recalling. Uh, then you have, of course, Ukraine 2014, the refugee crisis, Brexit, Trump, Marine Le Pen, law and justice in Poland, uh, COVID, all the way down to the 24th of February 2022 and the beginning of the largest war in Europe since 1945. Now, again, I have to qualify that or nuance that. While there is clearly a downward turn, a, a chain of crises, um, the EU itself not only survives, but arguably gets stronger across this period. Nonetheless, I hope you will agree that there is something to be explained in that downward turn the question what went wrong, which liberals have been debating ever since. And very quickly, let me suggest three kinds of things that explain what went wrong. The first is what I would call a historiosophical mistake. Put it, it's most, most, most simple, it's a fallacy of extrapolation we took the way things had gone through those 35 years and naively assumed that they would continue to go that way. So we took the most non-linear event in modern European history, namely the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and turned it into a linear projection. Or to state it in more general terms, we took history with a small h, which is always the product of an interaction between structure and process on the one hand, deep structure and process, and conjuncture, contingency, chance and choice, collective will and individual leadership on the other, and turned it into a history with a capital H, understood as a Hegelian process of inevitable progress towards the spread of freedom. That's the historiosophical mistake, which, by the way, kicks in not as many people think with Francis Fukuyama in 1989-90. That wasn't the moment of hubris. It's in the early to mid 2000s when things seem to have gone so well since 1989 that the hubris sets in. And that's my second category of explanation, because there are 
multiple variants of hubris. I'll just mention just a few uh, for reasons of time, and then we'll have time to talk about it in discussion. Obviously, the hubris of the United States marching into Iraq, the hubris of Tony Blair's cool Britannia, believing that you could open, open, open without limit, and there would be no reaction to it. What the German sociologist uh, Andreas Reckwitz called apatistic liberalism, the liberalism of constant opening, the hubris of the Eurozone, the hubris of a globalized financialized capitalism, which not only gave us levels of inequality not seen for a hundred of years, not only led us into the Great Recession, but also assumed that global aggregate gains would not merely justify but compensate for local specific losses. If you like, it's an economist's mistake because there were indeed the aggregate global gains. Hundreds of millions of people in India and China were lifted out of poverty, but that didn't help the people in the North of England or the Southeast of Poland or Northeastern France and populism taught us that lesson. The hubris of believing that it's the economy stupid that if you only get the economy right, all else will follow. And again, I think populism taught us that issues of culture, community, and identity are at least as important as socioeconomic inequality. The inequality of attention and respect, as I call it, is as important as economic inequality. The hubris of the EU itself which in the early 2000s tended to believe or to speak as if the world had only to graciously follow our example and follow us down the path to rules-based order, international law, multi-level governance, and uh, polycided cooperation. Mark Leonard's book of 2005, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, and the hubris of believing that we were indeed moving towards Immanuel Kant's eternal perpetual peace, and the peace could be secured simply by diplomacy, dialogue, um, economic interdependence, so it's fine to become more dependent on Russia for energy, what the Germans call Verflechtung, and that you didn't also need military power, containment, credible containment, credible deterrence. And that leads me to the final point, which is the failure to learn one lesson of history. Um, the great German historian Reinhard Koselleck has a wonderful essay called The Unknown Future and the Art of Prognosis. And he makes a very simple point that the more recurrent a phenomenon is in history, the more likely we are to be able to make probabilistic statements uh, about the future on the basis of that experience. So for example, the statement, we shall all die, has a rather high level of probability because in a huge historical data set, there are very few examples to the contrary. So revolutions, wars, what happens to people when they're in power too long. These are recurrent phenomena we have. Okay, so one of these recurrent phenomena is the decline of empires. We know quite a lot about that. And one thing we know about imperial decline is imperial powers don't like it. Ask the British, ask the French, ask the Portuguese, ask the Germans. So when the largest remaining European empire, namely the Russian Soviet empire, just softly and suddenly vanished away in just three years between 1989 and 1991, we shouldn't have assumed that was the end of the story. We should have understood that there was likely to be a reaction. I met Vladimir Putin in 1994, totally unknown deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. No one had heard of this guy, rather unpleasant looking man at a conference in St. Petersburg. And at the end of a two day conference, he pipes up and says, we have to remember that there are territories that have historically always been Russian and the Russian Federation has a duty towards them. And he specifically mentioned Crimea, 1994, 
20 years before 2014, five years before the first NATO enlargement. Don't tell me NATO enlargement was responsible for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So the imperialist revanchist instinct was always there. Now, I don't think it was unreasonable of us to try to do a modernization partnership with Russia, to try to help a desirable transition in Russia. But starting in 2008 and at the latest in 2014, with the seizure of Crimea and the beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine, because Ukrainians always remind us the war didn't start last year, it started nine years ago, we should have woken up and said, aha, we know from history what's happening here. The empire is striking back. And I would argue, I mean, you can never prove the counterfactual, but I would argue that if we'd had a much stronger reaction then, and we can maybe talk about this in discussion, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. Very quickly, just before I, we go into discussion, because I've gone on a bit longer than 20 minutes, um, three thoughts for where we go from here. Very, very quickly. First of all, nothing is more important than that Ukraine should win this war. Our strategic goal should be that Ukraine should regain control of all its territory, including Crimea because that is the only way in which we're then going to be able to construct um, a, a stable, lasting European security order and in which Russia will have learned a lesson. Secondly, Heraclitus, war is the father of all things. The bigger the crisis, the bigger the opportunity. Basically, the agenda of what I call the enlargement of the geopolitical West has been stalled for the last 15 years. So Croatia, Croatia slips into the EU, a few small countries slip into, slip into NATO, but basically it's been stalled. Now suddenly that logjam has been broken. There's a strategic commitment to at least the enlargement of the EU to include not just the Western Balkans, but also Ukraine, Moldova, and potentially Georgia. I would argue that our strategic goal in Europe, and I speak as a European over the next 10 years, should be to do another big double eastward enlargement of both the EU and NATO, because that is the only way in which we are actually going to make real progress towards a Europe whole and free. It is the only way in which you're actually going to secure countries like Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia against what is likely for a long time to come to be a very dangerous Russia. That, of course, is a huge challenge. It has to be done very differently from the way it was done before. It requires a further deepening of the EU, but I personally find it a very exciting prospect. Last quick point, what the war in Ukraine has revealed is something that was actually developing throughout the 30 plus years since 1989, which is our transition to what one might reasonably call a post-Western world. That is to say, a world in which the West as a whole is no longer setting the agenda of world politics. Um, and we've seen that in the Ukraine war with the position taken not just by China, but by India, Turkey, South Africa, and Brazil. So whereas in the 50 years on which my book concentrates, we've been thinking most of the time about ourselves, about reuniting our continent, about creating a European Union, about all the internal agendas to Europe broadly conceived, I think the new agenda is as much, if not more, about our relations with the rest of the world, and particularly with the non-Western great powers, or indeed non-Western smaller powers, who no longer accept the bipolar framing. Are you with us or against us? Are you with the West or the North, or are you against it? Um, and that, I think, is, is a really exciting part of, of, the, of, of the new agenda for, for our homelands. And with that, I sit down and look forward to the conversation. <laughs>